Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone who's watching all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is the famous Brother Rashid. Brother Rashid would actually, he would be on my Mount Rushmore. He would be on. My, he would be on if I got to make a Mount Rushmore of the of the great apologists against Islam. Brother Rashid would be a uh, would be one of the four on that on that mount. Uh, hey Rashid, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. And uh, since this, I mean, I'm assuming a ton of uh, most of the people here are. Uh, we have, I mean, we have Christians. We have lots of Christians here. We also have lots of Muslims. We have lots of atheists. We have Hindus. We have, but basically, the the people here are uh, are interested a, a lot in the topics we deal with. And one of the main topics we will deal with is Islam. So I'm assuming that yes. a good number of the people uh, here are already familiar with you. And of course, uh, you notified um, you notified uh, uh, people as well. So they my know tribe, my tribe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your tribe. Um, but uh, for for those who might not know you, why don't you go ahead and give a little background as to uh, your background? And then before we get into our topic. Yes, my name is Rashid. I was born and raised in Morocco as uh, as a Muslim. Then I came to the Lord through TWR, through a radio program. Um, and then I did correspondence courses for four years. And after that, it was a long journey until I started in 2006 broadcasting on TV and doing apologetics about Islam since 2006 until now and still going. Well, that's <laughs> that's a brief summary. <laughs> that's awesome, and uh, it's good to have you on here because uh, uh, y- you may be familiar with this, but um, um, a lot of Muslims they tell everyone to convert and to believe in Islam, but as soon as you start pointing out problems with Islam, they say, "Oh, but it only works in Arabic." Yes, <laughs> you guys can't understand it because it only works in Arabic. Well, guys, go ahead and try. Go ahead and try that now. Go ahead and try that now, because because brother Rashid, brother Rashid is is on. All right. Well, yeah. uh, why don't you before you before you actually get into your presentation, why don't you just give people an idea of uh, what we're talking about and what what we're going to be talking about and why it's important. It is important. Uh, we are going to talk about the biography of Muhammad. The oldest biography of Muhammad we have is according to a guy named Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad Ibn Ishaq. So that's the oldest biography we have. Mm -hmm. When we were Muslims, that's where we get all of our information about Muhammad, because the Quran doesn't talk about the biography of Muhammad, doesn't give us any clue who was Muhammad, who was his dad, who was his mom, mm-hmm. uh, no details about him. Mm-hmm. Just four times was mentioned Muhammad, that's all. Mm-hmm. So if we need to know anything about Muhammad, we go to the biography of uh, Ibn Ishaq. So it is very important. And um, we actually uh, took everything in that biography for granted. And then when I started studying it, I found out there are striking similarities between the biography of Muhammad and the Gospels, and this is what we are going to di- discuss tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just want to, I just want everyone to realize how big a problem history is going to turn out to be for Muslims here, because uh, naturally, uh, just like Brother Rashid just just pointed out when. When I started studying Islam, this was this was this was where I wanted to go, right? I wanted to know yes. what are your what are your earliest sources, right? That's the natural inclination. I don't want something that yep. comes from two, three, four hundred years afterwards. I want the earliest, and so I looked up what's the earliest biographical source on Muhammad, and it's the life of Muhammad. It's right here. Yes. So Ibn yes. Asak, so this it's Ibn Asak. So started reading that, and then I would I would find some really embarrassing material in here, and I would bring it to my friend Nabil because he was the reason I was studying any of this in the first place. And I would go to Nabil and I would say, "Oh my goodness, look at what this says! Mm-hmm. You got this story yeah. of this the satanic verses right here." And I would start pointing out all this stuff, and that's when Nabil told me, um, "Well, no, uh, you 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 should only go to later Muslim sources like Sahih al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Come to, only come to me 
me with that material. So I started, I started, uh, that's, that's why, I, that's why I bought Sahih Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and started going through those. And mm. then I was coming to Nabil with that material. And finally he said, well, since, since hadiths can be fabricated, only come to me with uh, material from the Quran. And yeah. so I'm, I'm just, I'm just, uh, even back then I, I noticed it, Brother Rashid, that, that if they're telling, if they, if, if they tell me that their earliest source can't be trusted, and they're telling yeah. me not, I, I, I can't even bring stuff from the later sources because they're all these fabricated hadiths. And then you read about people like Bukhari, who had to go through literally hundreds of thousands of narrations mm -hmm. to get to those ones that he considered most reliable. And then Muslims attack those and say, don't believe those. They're basically telling me that the early centuries of Islam, the early Muslim community, were the biggest bunch of liars and fabricators the world has ever seen. And then they're telling me to trust in the man who produced this community to tell that I'm supposed to trust that community, what they say about Muhammad. And you guys are the ones telling me I can't trust any of these people. Now, now all of that comes from what Muslims have said, but you're actually, you've actually, you're going to argue that we actually can't trust our earliest source. Yes, uh, actually, we can't trust it. We can't trust the biography of Muhammad according to Ibn Ishaq for several reasons, and uh, uh, I will go through them right now. All right. So, uh, All right, my so, first, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just ahead. wanted to tell everyone, you're, you're going to put a PowerPoint up, right? Yes, okay. here it is. All right, one, one second so I can get you full screen. I will get myself uh, out of this. And ladies and gentlemen, I will, uh, I will just let uh, Brother Rashid go through his presentation. If anything uh, isn't clear for some reason, um, then uh, uh, we, I might jump in for a, for a comment or a question or something like that. Other than that, the show is yours, Brother Rashid. Yes, uh, first of all, I will call it the biggest forgery in history because we believe a biography, we believe that it's authentic, but it turned out it's not authentic at all. So Muhammad's biography, um, I call it the biggest forgery in Islamic history. The first big question, why we do not have a biography of Muhammad in the first hundred years? Is there a reason, an excuse? Look at Christians, for example. They were persecuted. They had, um, they, they, they suffered. They were killed. They were burned alive. They had so many problems. They didn't have power. They didn't have the means. But still, they were able to write not just one biography, four biographies from the first hundred years of Christianity. Why nothing similar happened to Islam? Uh, Islam, they had the power, they were, they were the rulers, they had the money, they had the writers, they had everything, but still they didn't produce a simple biography of Muhammad in the first hundred years. So that leaves us with a big question. Is there a reason uh, to doubt? Probably there are so many problems with the, 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 the figure of Muhammad. Did he exist as we were told later? Is he the same person or something happened on the way? I think they forged his biography. So many things about him are not historical at all. And that's why they never wrote the biography the first time. So who wrote the, the first biography of Muhammad? His name is Muhammad, the same name as Muhammad. He lived from 699 to 769. And his name is Ibn Ishaq, means his dad was Ishaq. Ibn means the son. So Muhammad, the son of Ishaq, the son of Yasar, Ibn Yasar. Just for you to know, Yasar was a Christian. And when Muslims invaded Iraq, what is called today Iraq, Khalid ibn al-Walid, he took this young boy, Yasar, he took him as a slave to Medina. And he sold him to the family of Muhammad. So he was a slave, belongs to the family of Muhammad, the Asar. He was a Christian. He was the sources, the only sources of, uh, of Islam. They tell us Ibn Sa'd, for example. He tells us that Yasar was studying in a church. He was studying theology and the gospel. So Yasar, the grandfather of 
Muhammad ibn Ishaq was Christian. He was very familiar with the Gospels. So I'm sure that ibn Ishaq uh, knows Syriac and knows Christianity because of his family's history. And that's why he was uh, able to write such uh, a biography. And why he wrote it, if you go to the Gospels, uh, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. 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 And and another another thing we should note here, he went to Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh I, I apologize to everyone. I just talked for a couple of minutes and I had muted my mic. <laughs> All right, everyone. Oh. Everyone, that was my that was my fault, everyone. I had muted my mic and then I started talking for a couple minutes. Uh, I started talking for a couple minutes. Rashid could hear me talking, but you guys couldn't hear me talking. Uh, so he could hear me through Skype, but you guys couldn't hear. Uh, anyway, sorry about that. Um, uh, anyway, what I was saying was I was talking to Karm because Karm said in my book, it said Muhammad died in 632. I was pointing out that uh, Muhammad on the slide here is not Muhammad the prophet. This is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq, right? The author yes. of yes. the author yes. of the Sirat Rasul Allah. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're not talking about the Prophet Muhammad right now. Muhammad Ibn Ishaq wrote the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, Rashid here has on the slide. He he just breaks it down into Muhammad. So his his first name is Muhammad. He's called Ibn Ishaq, which just means son of Ishaq. So that that's that's his uh, that that Ishaq is his father, and then his grandfather was a Christian slave. And so Brother Rashid is pointing out that. The uh, that Ibn uh, Ibn Ishaq, who wrote this biography, would have been familiar with Christianity because he comes from a Christian family. So I'm assuming I I, I do not know Rashid's presentation. I, I haven't seen it before, but uh, I'm assuming that that is going to be very important for what what's coming up. Yes, it's very important because. He knows the Gospels. He knows Syriac. He's very familiar with Christian literature. And he knows the biography of Jesus Christ, which is in the Gospels. Uh, Ibn Ishaq went to what is called now today Baghdad, went from Medina uh, to Iraq. I'm, I'm sorry. He went what, uh, to what we call today Iraq. And he wrote the, the biography of Muhammad in Iraq, in his, the town of his grandfather, Yassar. So he went there. And why he wrote the biography of Muhammad? If you, if you read the Gospels, you don't find anybody paying the writers to, to write uh, a biography. They, they were not paid to do it. They, they did it because they loved Jesus Christ. They loved their master. And they wanted to write down everything he said, everything he did, and tell everybody else about it. But uh, for, for, for Muslims, the, the reason why Ibn Ishaq wrote this, because the caliph, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, ordered him to do it. He, he, he gave him an order and he paid him as well. So he was paid, ordered by the caliph to do it. And that's a huge difference with the, the, the Gospels uh, because they were written for different reasons. And that brings us to uh, the Caliph, the Caliph al-Mansur. 
He ruled from 754 to 755. Uh, 775. So we are assuming sometime between 754 and 769, this biography was written. The time when Muhammad ibn Ishaq died and the time when the caliph ruled. So there are some 15 years there. So um, to give it an estimate, um, Muhammad died 632, the prophet Muhammad, and the first biography probably written around 760. And that's a huge gap. We have almost, almost um, 130 years gap. Um, it, it's, it's, there are so many things that can happen during 130 years. And as I said at the beginning, why they never wrote a biography in the first 100 years. There is another problem. Do we have a copy of the biography of Ibn Ishaq? No, we don't. So what we have today, actually, it's not the biography of Ibn Ishaq. It's the biography of Ibn Hisham. That's another problem we add to Ibn Ishaq. So we have 130 years, but still we have zero biography. Who is Ibn Hisham? Ibn Hisham is a student to Ziyad al-Baka'i. Ziyad al-Baka'i is a student to Ibn Ishaq. See the gap now? It's from 769 to 802 to 833. So actually, we have a biography that was written 833. That's 200 years from the death of Muhammad. Ibn Hisham, he heavily edited the biography he took from this guy, Ziyad, which he edited from Ibn Isha. So we have a forged biography edited by a student and handed to another student who edited that edited biography. So uh, the, the gap is big and the problems are getting bigger. So now it's 200 years from 632 to 833. What's the reputation of Ibn Ishaq, the original writer or the, the, the guy who we were told he wrote the biography? He was known as a forger among Muslim scholars. Do you know him? Do you know he forges stuff? He makes up stuff. Malik Ibn Anas, which is he's the founder of the Maliki school, said about Ibn Ishaq, Dajjal min al-Dajajila, means he is one of the biggest liars. He is a quack of many quacks. That's what he said. This is a scholar. That's not me or, or David. That's Ibn Mal Malik Ibn Anas. Malik Ibn Anas, he is the, he's one of the biggest early scholars in Islam. He said, never trust Ibn Ishaq because he's one of the biggest liars. So Muslims are telling me today they got their biography from the biggest liar ever. Not trusted by Al-Bukhari or by Ahmed. They didn't trust him. So that's why we don't find his hadiths in Sahih Al-Bukhari or in Musnad Ahmed. Because they don't trust him. They don't rely on him. And But still, we have his biography until today. And I want to add this. David, you debated so many Muslims. And I'm sure they bring that the paraclete or Paracletus is Muhammad, right? Oh yeah, that's uh, that's one of their their that's their favorite passage to go to in the New Testament. They have Deuteronomy eighteen eighteen is their favorite from the Old Testament, and this is the favorite from the New Testament. The first guy who forged this argument is Ibn Isha. He is the one who came up with this idea because he tried to forge everything in the Gospels and make it look like it is about Muhammad, not about Jesus. So he is the first one who made this argument. And since then, nothing changed. The dad repeated the same thing. Zakir Naik repeats the same thing even until today. They are not creative. They just repeat what Ibn Ishaq said for 1300 years. 
So next time when they bring it, tell them who was the first one to use this. One of the biggest liars in Islamic history, as Malik uh, uh, said about him. So now we go back to the Gospels and Muhammad's biography according to Ibn Hisham, who took it from Ziyad, who took it from Ibn Ishaq, which was 200 years later from the time when Muhammad died. The first thing that Ibn Ishaq started the, 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 the biography with is the genealogy. Does that ring a bell for you, David? He started by Ibn, son of that, son of that, son of that, son of that, to go up. Yeah, sounds like a gospel. Exactly. So why, why would Ibn Ishaq start with the genealogy? Because he was copying from the Gospels. He was looking at a model. So if, if you were in the 7th century or the 8th century and you were going to write a biography, what is the best source to go to? What is the most available biography around you if you are, if you are in a Christian environment in, in what is called today Iraq? It was um, a Christian, 100, almost 100% 100 Christian. Mm -hmm. So he looks at the Gospels and he knows Syriac. So he started imitating everything in the Gospels. So he started with the genealogy to prove that Muhammad is the son of Ishmael to bring him to Abraham, to, to find a legitimacy. So he forged, the first thing he forged is the genealogy of Muhammad. And let's look at some striking similarities. The biography of Muhammad starts with the genealogy. The Gospels, especially Luke and Matthew, they start with the genealogy. And there is a star of Muhammad. I'm going to show you the page later. There is a star. It's called the star of Muhammad. And I think everybody knows the star of Bethlehem, the star of Jesus. So that, it doesn't take a brain to know that. The prophecies about Muhammad, the first thing that Ibn Ishaq started talking about are, are Christians and Jews talking about the coming one, the prophet. And that looks like the Gospels exactly because Matthew brings the prophecies first before he starts talking about the mission of Jesus Christ. So we have three elements, genealogy, the star, and the prophecies before the mission of Muhammad. And that's a clear, clear, um, if I don't, if I, I don't want to say he stole it, at, at least it's a borrowing. The genealogy, it's in page three. If you have the same, uh, uh, if the same version as David, uh, when you show that the beginning, uh, it's in page three, and you will find Muhammad's star in page seventy. It says, "Tonight has risen a star, under which Ahmed is to be born." That's that means a, a, a Jew who said that. I heard a Jew calling out at the top of his voice from the top of a fort in Yetrib, and he told his fellow Jews that there is tonight a star was risen or has risen. The prophecies, we can find them in different pages, but especially page 79, the story of Bahira. When he went to Damascus, uh, Muhammad went with his uncle to Damascus. Uh, for for a uh, caravan, with a caravan, and and also Bahira saw his description in the Christian books. That's what the biography says. That this this monk, this Christian monk, found the signs of Muhammad in Christian books. So always uh, Ibn Ishaq is trying to find something in Christian books to say it is about Muhammad. Means he was looking into the Gospels. When did Muhammad go to Syria? Do you have an idea, uh, David? Did you hear it from Muslims? Um, no, actually, I have no idea. Uh, they say, if you ask any Muslim, mm -hmm. when did Muhammad go to Syria? They will say age of 12. Mm -hmm. That's not from the biography of Muhammad, but it's in other books. But uh, does that ring a bell at age of 12? Yeah, with uh, with Jesus traveling at at age twelve. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
So everything, they are trying to make it look like Jesus, everything about Muhammad. So at age of 12, he went to Syria and he had this, this discussion with the monk, with a, a, a Christian monk. The same thing, Jesus, he had a discussion with the uh, Jewish scholars when he went with his mom and dad. And other similarities, at age of 40, page 104, he started his mission or ministry, Muhammad. Jesus at age of 30. So Ibn Ishaq was playing with numbers here. And, and Muhammad went to the cave, cave of Hera, page 106. Jesus went, went to the wilderness. Muhammad was fasting. Sorry, I forgot an S here. Fasting for 30 days, page 106. Jesus was fasting for 40 days. So he adds a 10 here, he removes a 10 there just to make it look a little bit different, but it is the same. And he met, Muhammad met a spiritual being. They say it's Gabriel, the angel at page 106. Jesus met a spiritual being, but it was the devil. And this spiritual being with Muhammad, he coded what is called scripture, the Quran. And with Jesus, he quoted scripture, the Bible. So he, you can see there is a pattern here. Don't you see it, David? Um, yeah, there, there, are, there are some definite similarities here. Yes. And at the start of his ministry, Muhammad, after the encounter with, with, uh, with, the, with the angel, he came back and he started choosing disciples like Ali and like others, Khadija. And he started talking to others. He made many followers after that. The same thing Jesus did after uh, the wilderness. And Muhammad started his secret ministry, page 115. The same thing. Jesus was not, he didn't have a public ministry at the beginning. And then Muhammad proclaimed his ministry. The same thing Jesus did later in his town. And then persecution started. The same thing with Jesus, persecution started. And then Hijrah from Mecca. Then Jesus left Nazareth. And they attempted an assassination before he left Muhammad. If you remember, they put Ali instead of him, and then he left with Abu Bakr, and then they, they tried to follow them, and then they made it to Medina, if, you, if you're familiar with that story. And the same thing with Jesus. They attempted an assassination on the mountain. They tried to, to push him from the mountain, and he just went through them. With, uh, uh, it sounds like a miracle. And the same thing with Muhammad. It sounds like a miracle. He escaped. He, he went, actually, and they were looking, and they didn't see him. That's what the biography of Muhammad said. And then he started his expeditions or raids, and Jesus started his ministry. There are some striking similarities here, and I think Muhammad ibn Ishaq was borrowing from the Gospels and was forging a biography. We don't know for sure if these things happened. Actually, I have many doubts after seeing this. He made up so much so many things. According to uh, Muslim scholars, he is a liar, so I wouldn't be surprised if he makes most of this biography from just borrowing from the Gospels. And actually, he had a 12. If we go back to uh, the disciples, actually the first in, in Bayat al-Aqaba, they call it al-Aqaba, it's when, when the helpers 12 of them, they came and they, 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 they made a covenant with Muhammad. And that's in page 198. There were 12 of them. The first 12 helpers from Medina, there were 12 of them. And I, I wonder where he took that number 12 from. It's obviously from the, the disciples. There were 12 of them. And you can see it here, page 204, too. Um, the names of the 12 leaders in the rest of the story of al aqaba the 12 leaders. So Muhammad made 12 helpers, Ansar, like Jesus with the 12 Ansar or the 12 disciples. If you go to miracles, Muhammad healed Katada's eye, page 381. 
And we know about Jesus. He, he um, did heal the blind. Muhammad increased food, page 452. And Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread. And actually, there is a funny story here. Um, Muhammad, he multiplied dates because they couldn't talk about fish. It will be like obvious it's, it's, it's a forgery. So he changed it to dates instead of fish and bread. And um, I, I, li I like Ibn Ishaq when he tries to find something uh, that he, he changes to look like real. But um, you can catch him easily because if you follow the pattern of the biography, you will see clearly it's following the Gospels. In the last days, Muhammad was killed by a Jewish uh, lady. She poisoned him and Jesus was killed by Jewish leaders and the Romans, but especially by Jewish leaders because they were, they were the one behind it. So there are some similarities here. So if you, if, if you look at all these details, I think we are in front of one of the most um, forged biographies in history. And just to give a summary right now, if you have, if you have a biography written 200 years later, heavily edited, and then the writer is a famous liar, and not only he wrote it, he, he copied other books are you going to trust that? Are you going to say we are here about a historical figure? So many things about Muhammad are not historical at all, especially the miracles. If we know that the Quran denied miracles of, 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 for Muhammad, um, I'm going to read from um, chapter 17, verse 59. Nothing has prevented us from sending signs except that former people denied them. So the Quran says there are no miracles for Muhammad because previous people they didn't believe when we sent miracles to them. That's what the Quran says. And you find Ibn Ishaq filling his biography with hundreds of miracles to Muhammad just because he saw the Gospels are full of miracles. And then he, he realized it will, it will look really weak if Muhammad didn't have miracles. If, if we go back to the name Muhammad itself, I have doubts about the name itself. Muhammad is not a name actually, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a description. It's, it's, it's the glorified one. So he was trying to glorify Muhammad as Jesus. If we go back to, to, to Muslim sources, you will find his name was Qutum when he was uh, born, Qutb, not Muhammad. So when you name him the glorified one, the praised one, Muhammad is the praised one. The praised one is Jesus, not Muhammad. So everything about Muhammad was made to look like Jesus. He's the last one. He's the, uh, he's the, he's the Omega. He's the Omega. Uh, and, and we know Jesus is the, is the Omega, not Muhammad. So he's the last prophet, and he made Jesus look like the, the, the Baptist to them, to him. He announced the coming of Ahmed. He announced the coming of the one. Actually, um, in Islam, we name people Mustafa. Mustafa means the chosen one. And we believe that Muhammad is, was, his name was Mustafa, actually, was the chosen one. And the chosen one is the Messiah is the Christ, the chosen one, the invented one. He was chosen to save, to save his people, not Muhammad. So when you say he's the chosen one, he's the last one, and Jesus was like the Baptist to, uh, to, to him, then you are just forging a biography and making everything about Muhammad look like Jesus. You don't have an authentic person. You don't have a person to present here. You have an imitation. It's like the Chinese products. When, when the, the U.S. makes something, the Chinese just try to look at it and make something that looks like it, but it's cheap. It breaks easily. So Ibn Ishaq, he tried to make a figure that looks like Jesus, but it is cheap. It's made in China. It breaks when you look at it very closely. So Muhammad, there are so many things about him are fake if you look at it. We don't know actually how much was fake 
and how much was real. Is it 90%? Is it 80%? Is it 70%? We don't know. We just know that Ibn Ishaq was forging a biography. He was the biggest liar we, uh, you can have in Islam. Even Muslim scholars didn't trust him. And still we take the biography of Muhammad from him. So I'll leave, I'll leave, um, I'll, I'll leave it to you, uh, David, so you can start asking some questions. We can de uh, go deeper a little bit here. Yeah, um, this, is, uh, this is a tricky one. So I, I just want to break down basically two views of yes. Ibn Asak. And so one will be the sort of traditional view, and then this with the with the modified view. Because my position is my position is going to be, which we have no way we have no way of, of telling what what's going on in the in the early history of Islam. Because everyone's accusing yeah. everyone of lying, everyone's I inventing stories. Even Muslims today are telling us all these guys are are, are lying, and they tell us to go yeah. to much much later people instead of the earliest people, because the earliest people are liars. Well, if the earliest historians are liars, how are the where are the how are the later people learning more and more as they go on about Muhammad if they're not fabricating things? But uh, here's what you have. Here's what you have, ladies and gentlemen. So let me give you the the, the traditional view of uh, of of uh, basically those of us who deal with Islam. The, the traditional view of Ibn Asak. Um, Ibn Asak um, writes a biography and makes perfect sense that later Hadith scholars are going to attack him and call him a liar because. There were these two competing uh, schools of thought on history. You had your, your Hadith guys and you had your Sira guys, and they eventually uh, were in conflict. And the Hadith scholars were trying to consolidate power around themselves and say that their method was the only was the only correct method. And so they basically would start throwing all the, all the Sira guys um, under the bus. So that was one issue. The other issue was certain doctrines that were not around at the time of Ibn Asak were around at the time of later Hadith guys. And so some of this material was very embarrassing. Like uh, um, uh, Brother Rashid talked about Ibn Hisham giving us an edited version of Ibn Asak. One of the things he took out, for instance, was the story of the Satanic Verses. Ibn Hisham, I mean, he even says it. He even says we have to take out some of the stuff that Ibn Asak is yeah. talking about because it's embarrassing. So he took out the story of the Satanic Verses, even we, even though we know it was actually in there. So one of the things that happens is by the time you get to people like Bukhari and Muslim and so on, they regard lots of stories as false because they're so embarrassing and they've all started they've all started deleting the embarrassing history about Muhammad. And so what do you do if you've got a guy a century earlier and he's reporting it? Well, you just, you know, start call well, well, we'll start calling him a liar. So that would be that would be one that would be one uh, one view of Ibn Asak. The people are accusing him, are insulting him, accusing him of lying because he has all this embarrassing material, and they're trying to they're they're trying to set up a a rival methodology uh, and and say that their method of history is the only way of doing things. Therefore, other people are all uh, are all just liars. So that's that that's that's one view. But notice, whatever view you take, uh, you 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 you've got some problems here. So think about this view. Right? Think about this view, because you can be looking at those parallels and you, you might be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about that. Maybe, maybe there just were these similarities. But think about this. On the issue of miracles, we know, according to the Quran, as Brother Rashid mentioned, that there, Muhammad performed no miracles. He was challenged yeah. over and over and over again like a beating drum throughout yeah. the Quran by unbelievers. This is in the Quran. Perform a miracle. Come on. Why can't you perform a miracle like the like like the earlier prophets? Why can't why why are you why do you not have any miracles? And Muhammad over and over again, I'm just a warner, I'm just a warner, I'm just a warner, I'm just a warner. My only miracle is is the Quran. Suddenly you go to these later Muslim sources. You go to these later Muslim sources and they're filled with all of these miracle claims. Now, it's obvious that Muslims along the way they invent these miracle stories, but but think about that, yeah. right? So Yes. If Muslims are inventing the, the miracle stories, why are they inventing the miracle stories? They're inventing the miracle stories to make Muhammad seem more like people like Jesus who performed miracles. So yes. it's clear. So it, it's one, no matter what your view is, it's indisputable that the, that the early Muslim community is inventing things about Muhammad to make him sound like sound like earlier people who who could do things that Muhammad couldn't. So 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 the question is 
as, as Rashid pointed out, how, to what extent are they doing this, right? I mean, Muslims will yeah. tell Muslims will tell us that they're inventing that that people were lying about things like the satanic verses. That makes no yes. sense. Why would they make something up that's embarrassing to them? So that doesn't yeah. make any sense. It makes sense that that Muslims would invent a lot of stories to make Muhammad look better. But now the the question becomes. How much? How much were they inventing? We know they're inventing some things. We know they're inventing uh, uh, miracle stories. Yeah. So what? How much is it? And and Rashid, I just want to point out. See, like I I, I don't I don't believe that I, I don't believe there's any way Muslims were inventing things like uh, you know like the uh, like Muhammad and the Satanic verses. I take that as very very strong uh, historically based on the principle of embarrassment that people tend not to invent things that are embarrassing. And we know that was embarrassing yeah. because they keep changing the story as, as time goes on. But, uh, uh, but, but notice what you have here. You've got all the, you've got all, you've got the material that we know was invented by later Muslims to make Muhammad sound more like Jesus, like the miracles. But then Muslims are telling us that all these other stories, even embarrassing stories, those are fabrications. And so once again, what, once what we get back to is the early Muslim historians were the biggest bunch of liars the world has ever seen. It, it is kind of a position of we don't know. We 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 don't know. Is it ninety percent? Is it eighty percent? Is it seventy percent? Is it sixty? We gosh, it's uh when we, basically Muslims, when you guys are the ones telling us that that these guys are are lying about everything that you don't like. And then the stuff that you do like, like Muhammad's miracle stories, we know that that's what that we know that that didn't happen. We know that they're making that up. You're basically you're throwing your entire first couple of centuries of Muslim historians under the bus and telling us not to trust them, but then telling us to trust what these guys report about Muhammad that you like and you can't. There, there is another problem here, Dave. Mm -hmm. If we are accusing these guys of being a bunch of liars and the they cannot be trusted mm -hmm. how are we going to trust them with the quran because the quran didn't yep. come from another line yeah it came from the same people so if you are telling me they forge hadith what's going to stop them from forging verses if if they played with the sacred they can't play with any sacred text and especially they had some some reasons to do it the abbasids with the umayyads and the fighting overpowered. So they had so many reasons. And actually, I, actually, there is something I forgot to say here. Uh, Ibn Hisham, he removed something because it's going to be offensive to the, Abbas, the Abbasites. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he removed the, the, the fact that Abbas, their, their, their grandfather, he was one, one of the, the Quraysh people against Muhammad in Badr. So uh, Ibn Hisham, he removed that thing because it will offend the ruling party, the ruling family. So, so, he, so, he so, so, hang on. So, it's not just, it's not just, hey, this material makes our our prophet look bad, like with the satanic verses, right? We can't have our prophet no. delivering revelations from the devil. You're also saying it's purely political motivations as well. This, uh, the, my my leaders right now won't like this, so I need to change the story so I don't hurt the yeah. the feelings of my leaders. Yes, exactly. So when you have something like that, how are you going to trust them? What if we had some verses that are going to offend the Umayyads or the Abbasids? Probably they removed them. Probably they changed them. So we have nothing to trust here. We have no solid ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Muslims. It, it looks it looks it looks bad. You, you, again, this comes this comes from. You guys, right? You guys are the ones. You guys are the ones saying, "Oh, don't trust this guy." And pretty much anyone we go to, we find all kinds of people. Uh, we find all kinds of people telling us not to trust those guys. I mean, you know, this is on a this is on a big scale because any any Sunni source we quote, Shias will tell us, "No, those guys are all liars," right? Any yeah. Shia source we quote, Sunnis will tell us, "No, those guys are all liars." And then within those communities. They'll be attacking each other. No, this guy had the wrong methodology. He's a liar. No, he said something embarrassing. He's a liar. And they're all calling each other liars. And so no matter where we go to learn about your prophet, we have an endless array of devout Muslims saying, you cannot trust this man. He is a horrible, horrible liar and a deceiver, which means that we just have nowhere to go. Where can we go in Islam to learn about Muhammad where we are not going to be told by tons of Muslims, you can't trust him. He's a, he's a horrible liar. Where are we going? No, and 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 people of Quran only they have a bigger problem because oh, yeah. 
if if you rely on the Quran only, there there are some verses you have no way to know the meaning except through the biography and the hadith. Mm -hmm. I can interpret them in any way or shape or form if you remove the background, mm -hmm. if you remove the hadith and the seerah. Uh, there are some words in Arabic that you will not understand at all. Even for a person like me, who's the, the Arabic language is my first language and still I cannot understand them mm -hmm. because you need a commentary or a biography or the hadith to explain what happened there. Um, and and another, another problem, a, more than 80% of Islam comes from the hadith, not from the Quran. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you, if you rely on the Quran, there are no five prayers. How are you going to pray? Who told you there are five? And how, how, how are you going to perform those prayers? There, are no there is no description of a prayer in the Quran in details. And if you want to rely only on the Quran, who was Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Who was his father? Who was his mom? What happened? How do we know he got a revelation? Do you have the story there? You have no story there. And actually, let me open open a window here. The story of the revelation, if you read Ibn Ishaq, it was just a dream. If you read Al-Bukhari, it was a reality, it's not a dream. So the story changed. The early, the early biography, he saw a dream. If you go later, they removed the part of the dream and it became a real thing. He saw an angel. It was not a dream. And that's another thing that I need um, to emphasize here, that um, even the story of read, read, read in the name of your Lord, I think Ibn Ishaq borrowed it from St. Augustine. Because if you, if, you believe, if you read St. Augustine in the Confessions, he, he, he heard a voice telling him to read two times. And, and he took it as from the Lord. He was telling him to go read the Bible. And that that's actually was the turning point in his life. So if, 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 if Ibn Ishaq is familiar with Christian literature, I'm sure he heard about St. Augustine. And I'm sure he read some of his stuff. So probably he borrowed that story and he gave it, he made it about Muhammad. The Quran doesn't tell us how Muhammad got the revelation. So uh, uh, along along that point, along those points right there, um, that that Ibn Ishaq came from a Christian family that would have been familiar with uh, Christian sources, Christian stories, uh, yes. and we know we know that the early Muslims were inventing miracle stories. They're just fabricating these things. And so, guys, Muslims, what, 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 do, you, what do you do here? Uh, I, I would like to hear from some Muslims. We know you're there. We see you. We see you, uh, we see you guys. Go ahead, go ahead and tell us how, how can we learn about your prophet. Pl please tell us. Don't, don't say go to the Quran. As Rashid pointed out, the Quran only even mentions his name four times. You can't understand this stuff. You can't understand these, these verses without going outside the Quran. Now, that's a, that's a massive contradiction because the Quran claims over and over again to be clear, but it's just not, right? It's just not. That's why you have the yep. tafsir. That's why you have these commentaries trying to explain the background. But if, if that background, if the, if the tafsir trying to explain what the verses mean in light of the historical background, and we can't trust the people who gave the historical background because they're fabricating stories left and right, how do we learn? One, uh, put all this together. How do we, we can't understand the Quran because we can't, we, we can't know to what extent we can trust the, the biographers and therefore we can't know if we can trust the commentaries because they're going to uh, the, the, the hadith collectors and the, 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 the historians. But these guys are, are making stuff up left and right, and admittedly, even according to Muslims. So we can't, if we can't understand what the Quran, you got two problems with the Quran. One, if we can't understand what the Quran means without the historical background, and we can't actually know the historical background because your guys are a bunch of liars, that's a problem. Two, how do we, if, if we don't know the real historical background of Muhammad, how do we know whether we should trust him, trust his revelations, trust him as a true prophet and take the Quran seriously if we can't know anything about him because the people who are recording his history are making things up left and right. 
you've got a big mess on your hands and you're just telling us you're telling us no ignore all of that just ignore all of that and just just believe in him anyway and uh all i can say is no yep. yeah how, how do we know that muhammad has a had a wife named aisha yeah you don't you don't read it in the quran mm -hmm. how do you know who's zaid who is mentioned in the quran and what mm -hmm. happened to him and and why that verse is there mm -hmm. and 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 how do we know that his wife was Zainab we have no way to to say so I'm just giving examples that mm -hmm. the, the, the the story or the the verses are are really ambiguous uh, you cannot tell the meaning unless you read the biography mm -hmm. and uh, I had a question here from uh, Alejandro who said uh, what do the satanic verses say? Um, the satanic verses, um, Alejandro, I have uh, actually got it right around here somewhere. Um, th th we have about 50 sources that have been translated into English on the satanic verses. Uh, uh, Shahab Ahmed, before he died, uh, post, I mean, uh, it, the book came out afterwards, but he had assembled 50 sources on the satanic verses. But uh, the, the, the earlier versions of the story basically say that Muhammad was longing for a revelation that would help uh, his people come to Islam. So he's upset that his people weren't coming to Islam. So he's longing for a revelation, and then he starts receiving Quran verses, but then Satan sneaks in there, and he receives these verses saying that Muslims can pray to three pagan goddesses, Allah, Alus, mm -hmm. and Manat, and that uh, these are, they're basically like these, you can think of them as, as like bird goddesses who can take your, take your, carry your prayers up to Allah. So you can, t they're intercessors. You talk to them and then they will carry your prayers uh, to Allah. So it's okay to pray to them because, you know, Allah is still the main God. So Muhammad received these revelations. He delivered them to his followers. He bowed down in honor of them. His followers bowed down, but then the pagans saw this. The pagans saw this and they bowed down too. They bowed down because Muhammad had honored had honored their pagan goddesses and shown support for them. Anyway, Muhammad comes back a little later, this is according to the story. Muhammad comes back a little later and says, sorry, the devil made me do it. Satan tricked me into, into delivering these verses. And there are so many, so many issues with, with that when you put all this together. I mean, uh, one, Muhammad deli admittedly delivered a revelation from the devil, which according to uh, Deuteronomy 18.20, he would have been stoned to death by Moses. Moses would have stoned him to death for, for delivering a revelation that actually came from Satan. Two, it means Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Why in the world am I trusting your revelations when admittedly you can't tell, yes. the, di you can't tell the difference? Uh, so you got all these yeah. problems. Third, it just shatters the idea that no one can no one can make something like the Quran. Satan gave verses. The Muslim community couldn't tell the difference. They didn't say, "Oh, that's different from the Quran." The Quran is so eloquent, but Satan's Satan's verses are are, are much worse. So it destroys the idea that no one can come up with something like uh, like mm -hmm. verses of the Quran. So you just end up with so many problems here. And in addition to all of this, you have the historical problems where Muslims start. Uh, start trying to weed this story and many other stories out of their sources because it's so embarrassing and humiliating, which is why it's just hard to trust these guys. And so this, guys, this is one big, massive mess here. I mean, we can we can quote your sources and we will quote your sources. We'll keep quoting your sources to show you uh, that you got some really weird stuff in your sources, but it is hard to take all this stuff seriously. Yes. All right, so um, I guess we uh, anything anything else you want to go into before we start uh, taking some questions here? Well, I, I mean, I, I just want somebody um, to start thinking. Uh, I used to believe this stuff. I used to take this biography seriously. I used to trust it with all my heart. And, and when you start studying and using your logic, I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. I cannot trust. I cannot trust Ibn Ishaq, and how I'm going to trust these guys with my life, with my eternity? There, there is a huge problem if you cannot trust them with little stories and yep. they can change them and play with them. Do you think I can trust them with my life? There is, there is, there is a huge question that a Muslim should ask. It's not, it's not a fight, a game between Islam and Christianity. It's a gambling with your own life. I, I, am I going to trust Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham? They are saying the truth? No. But I'm going to trust the guys who gave their lives for what they believed. 
all the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, they were bur they, they were killed for their faith. Some of them, they were they were crucified, like Peter, as the ch church history says. So all of them except John, they gave a price for their faith. So I can't trust them because they died for what they believe. These guys didn't die. Ibn Ishaq didn't die for these things. He just made stories so the caliph can pay him. And the more he writes, the more he gets paid. He, he didn't have the, the, if he had a fate behind it, why Muslims waited for all these years to write the biography of Muhammad? Mm -hmm. that, that's the question you should ask. And, and plus, when you see somebody reading the Gospels and trying to borrow stories from them, it means they have nothing to offer. They have nothing to give. They just were looking around them and trying to copy other stories. It's like a student in an exam. He has nothing to give, nothing to produce. He's just looking around to other students who did their work, their homework, and he's trying to get stuff from them. Jesus had something to give. The disciples had something to give. But uh, Ibn Ishaq, had, he knew that Muhammad had nothing to give. He was borrowing and he was patching stories from here and there to make uh, a figure like Muhammad and present it to the whole world. So these are, are my comments and why I want to bring the story of, uh, of uh, uh, the biography. Because for me, it was a big shock. Mm -hmm. For me, it was a big shock to read. And that's why, by, by the way, if you read the Quran, you find that the Quran asks you to, to ask the people of the book. Mm -hmm. But when you go to hadiths and other stuff, they don't allow you to ask the people of the book. And that's, that's, that's a dilemma because they know we will find out. I always ask myself why they are not allowing us as a Muslims to read Christian books. Why they are telling us they are forced. Because... If we read them, we will find out. We will find out that these guys are lying. They are borrowing stuff. They are, they, are, they are doing plagiarism. They are taking stuff from the Gospels and they are, they are uh, uh, claiming Muhammad did that. No, he didn't multiply the food. Jesus did. He didn't heal the blind. Jesus did. If he healed the blind, the Quran will talk about it and will brag about it. But he never did. Mm -hmm. So, so th there is a dilemma here, and I think from all my heart, I'm just addressing every Muslim, just to think, forget, for, forget about David and Rashid, mm -hmm. just think about yourself. Are you going to trust Ibn Ishaq? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and and here, notice Rashid. Muslims Muslims do the same thing today that they were doing back then, right? Yeah. Um, it, one, they'll, they'll make stuff up left and right. right? They will make up all kinds of things about Muhammad. Um, so, so that's one thing. But uh, as far as the removing embarrassing material, think about this. The earliest source contains all of this embarrassing material and Muslims start removing the material and they sanitize yeah. it based on their theology and based on their, their, their goal mm -hmm. of, of glorifying Muhammad. And they keep, they keep removing material. Well, here we are. 14 centuries after Muhammad, and we have the sources like like uh, Bukhari and Muslim that have already supposedly been sanitized. In other words, they they the Muslim community over two centuries had removed the most embarrassing stuff, and they got to the yeah. material that they thought was most reliable. They got to the material they thought was best. Uh, again, B Bukhari went through, according to him, hundreds of thousands of stories to get to the best stuff about Muhammad. And then we give this material to Muslims today and say, look at all the horrible things your prophet did. And they start, no, 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 he didn't do that. No, he didn't do that. No, he didn't do that. Yeah. These guys, th someone must have made those things up too. So it, it's just, I mean, there's, here's the problem. There's nowhere we can go to learn about Muhammad, apparently. But Muslims have this idea of Muhammad in their head as this great, wonderful man. Muslims, where are you getting that idea from? Where are you getting, yeah. I, you know where you're getting it from? You got it from your imam. You got it from your yeah. parents. 
You got it from yeah. the Muslim community. You did not get that from anything remotely resembling a historical examination of Muhammad. And if you wanted to do a historical examination of Muhammad, you have to go to those sources. And if you go to those sources, your conclusions are Muhammad was one of the weirdest, creepiest, most perverted people ever, or yeah. those sources are all lying, in which case I have nowhere to go. And all I can do is just go with what my imam told me that, that goes against all evidence ever. This is a, what an amazing religion. This is the religion that we're all supposed to convert to. This is a religion that you condemn <laughs> Rashid for yeah. leaving. Uh, well, I, I mean, the first thing you look at, uh, you look into, if somebody is asking me to convert to any religion, the first thing I look into is the character of the leader, the founder of this religion. Mm -hmm. And if if you are telling me to convert to Islam, I need to know who is Muhammad, mm -hmm. because I want to. I'm going to trust him with my life. And if I want to read about Muhammad, where should I go to? To Ibn Ishaq. If I, if I find out that Ibn Ishaq is lying and forging, and Ibn Hisham did the same thing to mm -hmm. uh, this biography. So you are telling me to trust a Muhammad that I don't know, I have no clue about him except some stories that could be fake i don't know 90 percent 80 percent 70 percent i have mm -hmm. i have i have no trust in these sources so don't ask me to follow a leader that i know nothing about and the things that i know about i'm not sure of them yeah and here, here's here's what's uh what's amazing is this complete this complete reversal of how history works um when you're dealing with with islam and muslims because muslims Actual historians, if they were, to, if they read your sources, if they read your sources, and they say, "What are the things in your sources that we can trust most as historians? What are the things that we that are that have the, the what are what are the things that we should trust most?" Historians would say the things that you should trust most are the most embarrassing things, right? Because those yeah. are those are the least likely to be invented. And, you know, things like miracle stories, they're not going to trust those as much unless you can make a really good case, which you can never make any case of any kind because the Quran says Muhammad never performed miracles, right? So you yes. can never make any case for something like that. So a historian is going to look at the embarrassing stories like uh, Muhammad taking the wife of his own adopted son, the Muhammad and the satanic verses, Muhammad getting yeah. caught with his uh, slave girl, Mary the Copt, and uh, then yeah. promising his wives, promising his wives that he would stop having sex with her, then getting a revelation saying, no, you need to go back to having sex with her. Go ahead and break your oaths. These kinds of yeah. things. Historians look at those kinds of things and they say, this is actually pretty decent material here because unless unless someone had a really good reason for making this up, this is not the sort of stuff people make up. So that's the strongest material. But that's the material that you guys say everyone is making up. <laughs> Yeah, and then exactly. you say, and then you <laughs> the say, other way around. Yeah, and then and then you say the things we need to trust about Muhammad are the things that we know were fabricated. Like, oh, you need to trust in his miracles because he did all these miracles. You tell us to trust the stuff that is obviously fabricated and to reject the stuff that is the strongest stuff historically. It's like Islam just reverses everything. It reverses the rationality of everything. How how can this be from God? I just I don't know. I, I, don't know. I have I have some questions to David, and 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 just think. Think with me. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. thinking loudly here. If you read the biography of Muhammad, you find out that his dad is named Abdullah, which means the slave of Allah. Mm -hmm. Don't you think this is made up? Because his uncles are the slave of pagan gods. Um, uh, Abdul Uzza, uh, uh, the slave of Al Uzza. That's the the guy who who had a, he had a surah about him, Abu Lahab. And then his uncle, the guy who took him to Syria. His real name is Abdul Manaf. He's the slave of another pagan god, Manaf. So if you have all the ankles are uh, uh, are slave of pagan gods, how come how come your dad is the slave of Allah? Mm -hmm. there, there is there is a question. I think they modified the name because it was so embarrassing, and they changed it. And if we go to his mom. Her name is Amina. Amina means like believer. Mm. So how come you, you? So you're trying to make his his mom a believer and his dad is the slave of Allah, mm -hmm. and 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 those names you don't. There are so many questions about these names. I think everything about Muhammad was was they they tried to forge it and make it look good. And and as you said, until today they are trying to edit. 
until today they are trying to modify and i think they will keep editing and modifying until uh, we have no record of anything historical about muhammad mm -hmm. um we have a uh uh let's see quick question here from tyler Tyler ask, uh, Tyler says, former Muslim here, can you ask how Waraka ibn Nawfal uh, fits into this picture? When he died, mm. revelation stopped. Did Muhammad get more stories from him also? So what? basically, what are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on Waraka? Do you think that was actually historical? Do you think Muhammad, if it was historical, do you think Muhammad, that's where Muhammad got, so, sounds like he's asking, did, is that where Muhammad got some of the stories from the Quran from, if he, if he had, uh, if he, if he knew a Christian? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, we have to deal with everything with 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 some uh, doubts here because I, I cannot trust the biography 100 percent. But as David said, uh, there are some principles when you come to uh, biographies like this. Uh, the, the embarrassing stuff should be trusted first and then we investigate the rest. Uh, uh, let's let's try to do it here. Why would a Muslim invent that his prophet was taking stories or at least listening to a Christian priest and then when he died, he tried to kill himself, commit suicide? There is no reason for a believer to invent something like this about his prophet. So most likely these stories were original. And they, they were edited and modified later to look a little bit milder. Probably they had more details into them. But uh, the stories got shorter and shorter because we had editors through history who changed them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, going back to, going back to um, the names, like why Muhammad's uh, dad is named Abdullah. Uh, yeah. if, if, if he comes from a pagan culture, notice once again, you can have a sort of, uh, more traditional view. You could say, well, uh, you know, Allah is just one of one God among many there. And then Muhammad eventually picked him and said, this is, this is the one God. So that's one possible explanation. The yeah. other, the other explanation is that's just added later by someone who, I mean, think if they're if they're if they're writing fake stories about Muhammad left and right, which we know they were, right? The question is, we do yeah. not we do not know the exact extent to which they were fabricating. There's no denying that Muslims were fabricating were fabricating stories about Muhammad. They were cooking up stories about Muhammad like they were cooking up falafel, right? I mean, they're just cooking them up, baking them, cooking, break, baking them up, baking them up, baking them up. Baking them up. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so the idea here is, well, we could explain it this way. We could explain it that way. We just don't know. We, we don't know. Maybe, 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 yeah. his, maybe his dad's name was Abdullah and someone recorded that. Maybe it's made up to make his dad the slave of Allah. We just don't know because according to what Muslims are telling us, these were the biggest bunch of liars the world had ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I, I mean, I have I have reason to doubt it because Ibn Ishaq is writing that uh, Amina uh, had some light enter it. So there was some light in Abdullah when he was going to her. And then when he slept with her, mm -hmm. uh, some light came out of him and went to this uh, to Amina. And we know that Jesus is called in the Gospels the light. So uh, I'm sure Ibn Ishaq wanted to somehow used that metaphor and, and that that illustration and made it about Muhammad. So the, I have reasons to doubt these stories because I see the, 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 the details are not really, we are not going to believe that Abdullah was going in the streets and somebody's looking at him and saying, hey, you have light there. What is that kind of light? And he just slept with a woman and then he came out and where, 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 where that light went? So no. we have no no reason to believe such a thing. So it, it's a made up story. So the the name will be the easiest thing to to make in this case. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we have a uh, we have a comment here from Abdul Rahman Muhammad. He said Ibn Asak was mentioned as a liar. Okay, I get that. Uh, not not quite uh, Abdul Rahman. You had Ibn Asak uh, definitely. Basically, all these guys were, were lying. And even if you think that some of them had good intentions, 
their methodology was to call everyone who shared anything embarrassing about Muhammad liars. And even even the ones that you tend to trust, like you, you know, Sunni Muslims generally trust like uh, uh, Bukhari and Imam Muslim and so on. These guys, acknowledge, I mean, Bukhari acknowledges that he has to go through hundreds of thousands of narrations to get to the ones yeah. uh, that he regarded as strongest. So there's no question that tons and tons of earlier Muslims, Muslims who came before him, are fabricating stories. And yes. the they come up with a methodology. Well, you tell me who you got it from and then who he got it from and who he got it from and who he got it from and who he got it from. And, it from, and I'll see if this is, this, is, this is all reliable. But notice, how do you know... <laughs> How do you know how reliable that third or fourth or fifth guy on the chain is? You have to take other reports about his reliability and, and what kind of person he was. This is just a big mess. And the, the, the bottom line is, once you acknowledge that your early generations of historians were this big bunch of liars, you, there's no getting out of it. And, and, and someone, someone, I, brought, you know, someone I, brought up earlier that uh, how do you keep going? You know, how do later, how are later people more trustworthy than earlier people? That's the problem you have in Islam. You go back to the first century, they don't know anything about Muhammad. You go to the next century, well, they, you know, they know enough to fill a biography. What? You go to the century after that, they have even more. The longer they go, the more people know about Muhammad, and that's just that's backwards. Go ahead. Uh, there are there are uh, I mean the rules they made to uh, choose the authentic hadith and differentiate between them and the false hadith or the weak hadith. Uh, I have a problem with that methodology. First of all, they don't apply it to the first layer of uh, companions. They apply it to the ones that came after. Because if they apply it to the first layer of, of companions, the first class of companions, we will not take anything from them. Because they were a bunch of, uh, they, they were disputing over authority, over power. So are we going to trust Aisha or Ali? Mm -hmm. And both of them tried to kill each other. Mm -hmm. So how, how can you trust a killer? So they, they, they made a rule and they made the exception to the rule. They say this will not apply to the first companions. So they stopped it right there. That's the first problem I have with it. The second problem, when it comes to Ibn Ishaq, for example, they should not take anything from Ibn Ishaq if we apply their rule. But when, when they listen to Malik, for example, and they say, well, we will not take the, the, the what do you call it, um, the, the talk of the peers. If, if peers slander each other because they lived in the same period of time and they were jealous of each other, we will not take their, their, their opinions seriously about each other. Because Ibn Ishaq said Malik, he, he made fun of Malik, and Malik, he said, this guy is is the biggest liar so they said we will not t take their their opinion seriously so here is again another exception to the rule so the, the the rule is just like it's flexible wherever you go they can make it fit mm -hmm. yeah and so ju ju just to remind everyone when you have that problem when you have the problem where your historians are admittedly admittedly uh fabricating things the uh, the the, the the only reliable material you can get out of that is the embarrassing material, the the, the material that neither side had any reason to invent, right? Yes. So yes. the the it's the embarrassing details about Muhammad, the satanic verses, Muhammad thinking that he was deemed possessed, Muhammad uh, trying to commit suicide repeatedly, Muhammad thinking that he was the victim of a uh, black magic that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. Uh, these are the kinds of stories that historians would look at and say, okay, uh, you know, even though you know, even though all these Muslims are calling each other a lie and stuff like that none of them had reasons to invent some of this material and therefore we yeah. can trust that material but that's the material you guys tell us we can't trust <laughs> we yeah. can't trust which means we can't trust anything and yet you're telling us to to believe in your prophet uh, I just want to say Abdul Rahman here said uh, uh, he said to say uh, Muhammad peace be upon him biography is cheap cannot be I don't know what you mean by that but you said he peace be upon him change the world for the better uh, Abdul Rahman please give us some ways give us a list of ways that Muhammad changed the world for the better because I can't think of one but maybe you could share maybe you could share one and uh, I'll be happy to take a look at it how did he change the world of Bani Khureza how, how they became better by not existing mm -hmm. how did he change the world of uh, Safiya by killing all her, her family? How did he change the world of 
uh, Zaid when he took his wife. Do you think that's better for Zaid? How did he change the world for us today? By followers like Bin Laden and like Zawahri and like Al Baghdadi and like all these guys. Tell me one thing that he changed the world uh, better into. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 even among his first followers, how did he change the world there uh, when when Ali is trying to fight with Aisha and Ali is trying to fight with Muawiyah and so thousands of people got killed in their fights? How did he change the world for them? How did he change the world for Egypt when they invaded them and took their girls as slaves and took their land and took their their uh, uh, their possessions? How did he change the world for my people, the Berbers in North Africa, when he invaded them? He took 120,000. The Muslims, when they invaded North Africa, they took 120,000 of Berber girls. How did he change the world for Berber people, for the Kurds, when he invaded um, uh, Syria, when he invaded what we call today Iraq? How did he change the world for those guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you could go down you could go down the line. Uh, I mean, all the people who've uh, studies show and I'll, I'll be posting some some material on this uh, in the, the very near future. Um, you, you look at any studies of the places in the world where women have it worse. Right. Where, where mm -hmm. the, the worst places in the world. The worst places yeah. in the world to be a woman in terms of the, uh, per, you know, the the uh, the view of women, the negative view of women, uh, you always get 11 out of 12 of the worst countries are Muslim majority countries or 18 out of 20 or 19 out of 20. You always get that. So this is, I this agree is with Muhammad's you. impact. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you and don't go even far. How mm -hmm. about people like me who left Islam? How mm -hmm. did he change the world for them? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, where in the world now they kill apostates? Is it in, in, in the U.S. and the U.K. and Australia and Belgium and in Canada or in Muslim countries? Mm -hmm. So l look at us. We are fleeing. We are fleeing Muslim countries just because we choose another religion. And we are asking asylum here and there. And every, every story, I, I met so many former Muslims, every story has a drama into it, mm -hmm. a painful one. A painful story. So, how did he change the world for us? Mm -hmm. uh, Tanvir here has a. Uh, we, we, we'll we'll ha we're happy to get back to uh, Abdul Rahman. By the way, uh, Rashid, um, um, <laughs> this is kind of funny because yesterday this kept happening. I was live with Sam Shamoon, and Muslims kept wanting. We would just bring something up. We would just mention something, and then they would challenge us on it, even though that wasn't what we were going to talk about. We would say, okay, before we get to our topic, let's go ahead and address this. So, so what would happen is we would just mention Aisha or something like that, and Muslims would say, oh, we'll prove this about it. Okay, and we start pulling up the sources and stuff, and then we say something else, and they say, oh, we'll try try proving that. And and uh, got yeah. to the it got to the point where after this happened over and over and over again, Sam says something about Muhammad, and I say, now Muslims, I understand right now what that you want to say he's lying. I understand that right now. Everything inside of you is saying, I never heard this from my leaders who always lie to us. Uh, therefore, Sam must be lying. But think, that's just happened over and over and over and over and over again. You you just yeah. keep you just keep thinking that we're lying, and then as soon as you say we're liars, then we pull out all your sources, and we were not going to talk about that. We weren't going to talk about Aisha being pu prepubescent. We weren't going to talk about that. You made us talk about that, right? Yeah. So so think twice, and then all of a sudden they got quiet, and they would not they would not uh, challenge Sam on that issue. But I think it's it, we got a similar situation here where Abdul Rahman is going to say, "Oh, Muhammad changed the world," and he's just going to get eaten alive. He here. changed and, the yeah. world, but to worse. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, Abdul Rahman, th think about what you say, because uh, you, you, you've got you've got Rashid right here and uh, he might he might want to point out some problems with it. Uh, Tanvir here says, here I have a question. You say that both Muhammad and Jesus have similarities in biography. If someone say that both are messengers of God, so most uh, so must have some similarities. I think it goes to prove. So I think he's saying that. The similarities between Jesus and Muhammad actually prove that they're both messengers rather than proving that there was some uh, some copying going on. Um, what, are, what are your what are your thoughts on that? I've got some thoughts on it as well. 
I mean, look at it this way. If if um, there is a writer, he knows David, mm -hmm. and then I asked him, uh, or like a friend of mine, he said, can you write us a biography of Rashid? And he started saying, well, Rashid is an American, and he has this uh he has white skin and he has blue eyes and he has this and and he started looking at everything about david and mentioning it about rashid we are not from the same source it's just one guy is forging a biography of another guy and just copying from the first one you have to prove you have to prove that Muhammad really performed miracles, for for example, because the Quran contradicts you. So the only explanation here is that Ibn Ishaq forged these things. Second, if we find out that Ibn Ishaq was a liar, then most likely he was not telling the truth about these things. He was forging them. And third, if you have a gap of 200 years, then there is a, a possibility of faking things more than if it was really close to it in time. So we have several reasons. I just mentioned few to doubt the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, guys, we're going to go for a few more minutes. We're going to close out around 9.30, so we got time for uh, a couple more questions here. But yeah, Tanvir, don't, 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 miss, don't miss the point here. Um, we know... We know for a fact that the early Muslims were inventing stories about Muhammad to try to make him sound like he was more like one of the biblical prophets or, or more like Jesus. We know that that is an indisputable fact. You can even see you, you, you can see where this starts in the Quran over and over and over again. The, the non-Muslims were challenging him. You're saying Muhammad's in the same line with these guys. Where are his miracles? Why isn't he, why isn't he performing miracles? And Allah, all Allah does is make excuses for why Muhammad can't perform miracles. And, and Allah's, uh, Allah's, you know, his ultimate point is, well, Muhammad brought the Quran. That's, that's all he really yeah. needs. And yet we go to the later sources and they're filled with Muhammad performing all of these amazing miracles. He just lived this amazing, yeah. mir miraculous life. Well, okay, it's clear that was such an embarrassing issue for them that they're making uh, they're making all this stuff up to make him sound like he's more in line with the people we read about in the Bible. What Rashid was pointing out is once you once you understand that they are doing that, once you know that they're doing that, the question is just how much are they doing that? And so he yeah. points out a bunch of similarities between uh, Ibn Ishaq's biography of Muhammad, the earliest biography we have. We know that Ibn Ishaq is familiar with Christian sources. One, he talks about he, he, he quotes he quotes the Gospel of John trying to defend Muhammad. He also comes from a Christian family, so he knows about the Gospel. Is he is he actually trying deliberately to make Muhammad sound more like? more like Jesus. We know he's doing that with the miracles. We know that. So the question is, yeah. how much is he doing that? And the, and the, the problem you have is we, we just, we just, we, we don't do, know. Right? Do you think the Quran will forget something like a star of Muhammad mm -hmm. and only to, after 200 years to, to be cited by somebody who came 200 years so mm -hmm. the uh, god himself forgot to mention there was a star of muhammad mm -hmm. but even his heart was able to remember that mm -hmm. uh, give me a break here um here's a here's another comment uh by abdul rahman he said uh so this goes back to the name issue he said why should we modify the parents name abraham's father was an idol worshiper why would we need to be embarrassed. Uh, I don't think you understood anything anyone was saying. Yeah, I have reasons to to say that because, for example, Muhammad didn't want to mention the name of his uncle, which was Abdul Uzza. He mentioned Tabbat Yada Abi Lahabin Watab. He said Abu Lahab. He didn't say Abdul Uzza. And even for Abu Talib, they call him Abu Talib. They don't say Abdul Manaf. So they, they never mention his first name. They mention his uh, uh, like nickname. They don't because it's very embarrassing for them. So that's why I have reasons to believe they changed the name of his dad and mom too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So Abdul Abdul Rahman. Uh, yeah, we we know we know where Abraham came from. Now imagine 
imagine that we had this story about Abraham and uh, and then supposedly Abraham came from pagans, but then it gave the name of his father. And let's suppose the name of his father was Servant of Yahweh. Well, then you might start wondering if someone's if someone's messing with the names, <laughs> someone's messing with the names, right? And, yeah. and so and so when we're reading about Muhammad and he comes from pagans and he's a he comes from a pagan tribe and then his father is is recorded as as being uh, the slave of Allah well then you, you you have a couple of options either you know Allah was uh, just one god among others and so yeah you're you're the slave of Allah you're the slave of Alusa I'm the slave of Allah we have all these we have all these you know uh, gods and goddesses and so on that's 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 certainly a possibility but given the fact that we know your earliest historians were making things up we just have no way of knowing and so it's always a possibility that they're making something up for for some other reason and so it, it, so basically any t here's the situation as far as as far as I can tell, Rashid. Any time we're reading a story in the Muslim historical works, the question should always be: Is there a reason to make this up? If there is, yes. if there is, then it's in doubt. Could have happened, yeah. but it's 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 in doubt. You can't trust it because we know these guys would gladly make up anything if they had a reason for doing it. And so, if there's a possible reason, you can't trust it. The only stuff you should be able to trust is if there's just no reason to make something up. Then you can say, okay, maybe maybe I got something. Yeah, up. And, and this brings the genealogy. Why would Ibn, why the Quran never mentioned the genealogy of Muhammad? Just Ibn Ishaq. Mm -hmm. And and why? Because that's why I say it's an invention. Because he he wanted to show him as coming from pure blood. Mm -hmm. They keep telling us he's from the best. He's from the best tribe, from the best people. That's not true. How how the best tribe are pagan worshippers, mm -hmm. and how the best people are pagan worshippers. So how how here we can say these people are better than the other people. So Ibn Ishaq was trying to show that uh, Muhammad came from a pure blood, but the Gospels, that, that's not what they were doing. He misunderstood the Gospels. They were trying to say he's coming from David. There's a, a, a lineage here that goes to the prophecies about him coming from the line of David. It's not about being from a pure blood. So he misunderstood thing and he applied to Muhammad and we ended up with this forged uh, biography. Mm -hmm. uh, Nazareth Emmanuel said, um, I am Christian, but I grew up among Muslim communities reading Quran to understand its sayings and which God they were worshiping. But I have found it senseless and unattractive to read it. Yeah, this would, this would be a good, uh, a, a good issue for you to comment on, uh, Rashid, because... You know, Muslims tell us that the Quran is the most amazing book ever. It's a most it's the most amazing book ever. Uh, in fact, the, the Quran's main argument for how you can know that it's the word of God is that no one can write something like it. It's just so wonderfully written. Um, the Quran is the worst. I can say that in my view, of the Quran is the worst book I have ever read. And I'm not just saying that because I disagree with it, right? I read I read books by atheists, right? I read books by atheists. Yeah. I read the I read the the hadiths, and sometimes the hadiths are very very uh, interesting. They contain interesting material. The Quran is the most boring, worst book I've ever read. It's horrible. Uh, I mean, it's I think <laughs> Rashid. There is a uh, uh, the most uh, one at least one of the most famous atheist critics of Islam in the 20th century was uh, named Anthony Flew. And so, yeah. yeah, he passed away and he became some sort of theist uh, shortly before he died. But he was asked, after he became a theist, after he started to believe in God, he was asked, do you think you'll ever actually join a specific religion like Christianity or Islam? And he said, no, I, I, no, I, I don't think I will. And, and but he was asked, what, what are your thoughts on them? Because this guy spent his entire his entire career studying religion. And he yeah. said, well, he drew he drew three differences between Christianity and Islam. He said, uh, he says, one, uh, the Apostle Paul was a brilliant scholar who spoke multiple languages and can hold his own against, you know, the philosophers of his time. He said he had a first rate philosophical mind. And uh, he basically says Muhammad is the op opposite. Right. He's a, he's a seventh century yeah. caravan, illiterate caravan robber, apparently. Um, so yeah. he, he draws that comparison. Then he compared the Bible and the Quran. 
uh, and, and, uh, and he also compared Jesus and Muhammad. He said, Jesus, regardless of your view, is an incredibly charismatic figure that anyone can read about and anyone can love. He goes, Muhammad yeah. most certainly was not. But when he compared the Bible and the Quran, he said, the Bible is an amazing work of literature that you can read even as an atheist and you can appreciate its content even though you think it's false. He said, to read the Quran is to do penance. You guys know what yeah, penance? Exactly. You know, you know what penance is, guys. That's where you punish. Yeah. That's where you punish yourself for your sins. So this is Anthony Flew, who's not a who's not a Christian, uh, who's not a Christian. He wasn't a Muslim, but he's comparing them, and he says to read the Quran is to do penance. That's what I feel like. That like I have to actually psych myself up to read it because it's so horrible. But but Rashid, what the Muslims will tell me when I when I say something like that is, it's because you're not reading it in Arabic. If you were reading it in Arabic, you would see how amazing it is and how it could only come from God. Now, Rashid, the, the, the reason I, ha I have a question here is these same Muslims who tell me, ah, this is, the, this, is, this is the evidence for Islam, they're the same people who tell me the Quran has been perfectly preserved, even though they're lying about that. They're the same people that say the Quran contains all these scientific miracles, even though the Quran is a scientific disaster. They're the same people who tell me Muhammad's greatest man ever, who ever lived, even though he did some of the worst things anyone could ever do. In other words, I have no trust in them because, like their early historians, they just make stuff up left and right to support their prophet. But you... You you can read the Quran in Arabic. So tell us all: Do you agree that it's that it's that? Do you agree with Muslims that it's a wonderful, amazing book, or is it is? I, I can't believe that it's as bad as it sounds in English. So so where is it? Is it somewhere in between? I think um, Christopher Hitchens said, um, "If the Quran was the word of God, it was dictated in a bad day." <laughs> So uh, it's 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 really it's a penis. It, it is really painful to read it because so much repetition, mm -hmm. no coherence in subjects. Jumps from Moses to Abraham to Jesus to Muhammad to the pagans to so you 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 see no consistency, nothing, no logic, and sometimes the logic is very very awkward. Is is and some. Some arguments that are presented there, they are fallacies, actually. They are, they are not arguments. You will be like, God himself is making this mistake. And when you read it, you will be like, that's enough. I cannot, I cannot. I'm a good reader. I like, I like to read in Arabic. And I actually, I'm a writer in Arabic. And I like to, to read so many books um, in Arabic until today. But I don't enjoy at all reading the Quran. And actually, the Quran itself, says in ver in chapter 4 verse 140 and he he says to the early muslim believers he said uh, and it has already come down to you in the book that when you hear the verses of allah means the quran they are denied and ridiculed so do not sit with them until they enter to another conversation means that the quran itself admits it was ridiculed by the arabs they made it, they made fun of it mm -hmm. and the quran tells tells the the muslims do not sit with them until they change the topic mm -hmm. that that is correct so do, apparently doesn't get doesn't get much better and rashid uh, one time i had this long drive ahead of me and i had the quran on cd but it's like the you know the professional reciters yeah, and uh, I so I thought you know what I got a couple hours to drive. Why don't I listen to this the entire time and actually see how you know how how good it is? I got the like this worst splitting headache of my entire life after driving for a while, uh, listening to the Quran being recited. Uh, anyway, interesting stuff. Um, uh, Johnson George here just asked, uh, uh, Brother David, where can I buy the history of Muhammad? Uh, you, you should be able to still get it on, on Amazon, at least in a used form. Uh, if not, it, it's available online. You can get it in PDF. So if you type in Ibn Asak, Life of Muhammad, it'll it'll come up. You can get it in, uh, yeah. in, in PDF form. All right, let's. right, uh, I'm just going to read out the Super Chats real quick, and uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, close out, and you can give any, uh, any final thoughts, final words. Um, sure. Apple Goo said, good morning, everyone. I'm guessing you are in a different part of the world, Apple Goo. Uh, Odisho and Cheryl R in Super Chat and with Super Sticker. Philippians 2.10 said a bunch of stuff in Arabic that I can't read. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, George Bond said, such a long time uh, I've se since I've seen Brother Rashid. God bless you. Thank you. Paul Bishop said, God bless you too. 
David, uh, Paul Bishop said, David and Brother Rashid, we pray for your ministry and keeping you well. God bless. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lisa, look with the super sticker. Uh, Andrew Tam said, any thoughts about Jay Smith's historical research that the origins of Islam and the character of Muhammad were post seventh century redactions? And so there were other people in the uh, in the chat bringing up Dan Gibson's uh, view. So what, what, yeah. what, 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 what's what's your what's a uh, what, what's your view, Rashid, on uh, on how much of this is? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a revision, revisionist, so I'm, I'm not really um, I have some reservations about Dan Gibson's work, uh, Petra, that um, Mecca was in Petra, not there. So uh, I will present and actually I interviewed him and I have something coming up uh, that I will present. It will be in English and have subtitles in Arabic. So you will hear my whole view about it. Yeah, and, and my, my view is uh, I'm withholding judgment until I see some uh, some additional research because you, you know you yeah. have you have the details about the mosques and they're not pointing in the right way and they're pointing somewhere else and I've seen I've seen Muslim I've seen Muslim responses saying no they're not pointing towards Petra and it's not pointing there and so on and so basically uh, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt until I yeah. can actually until I actually say okay here is exactly where the mosque is facing show me the exact direction it's facing uh, and then so so yeah yeah now notice we don't we don't just jump on whatever is critical of Islam if, if I'm going to use no. an art if I'm going to use an argument I want to see it uh, I want to see it thoroughly thoroughly defended um, yeah. and finally uh, two, two more Dion Dion says may God bless you both David and Rashid. Uh, and Eric Brown said, "Here is an obituary. Here is an obituary for the Quran. Cause of death was repeated flogging to vital areas with with facts and logic. Died on 4-27-2020, 2020, 9:30 p.m." So, uh, Rashid, uh, after your presentation, uh, Eric Brown wrote an obituary for the Quran. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, um, all right, so uh, so Rashid, uh, I guess we should go ahead and close out now. And yeah. uh, any final thoughts for anyone on anything? Floor is yours. Oh, all right. I just want to um, say thank you, David, for having me, and thank you for everyone who is following this uh, chat. And um, I just want you to think, um, when I started, when I got out of um, making given get, uh, trust in these sources 100 percent and i got out of that and i started comparing the gospel with the quran with the biography with other books then i started seeing um the 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 image clearer i think for every muslim here's an advice don't stay stuck within get out of it compare use some logic Get out of your emotions. Don't always just defend Islam because you are a Muslim. You need to defend the truth wherever you find it. So that's what I did. And I think you should do the same thing because Muhammad will not save you. It's knowing the truth. The truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, one, one last comment because it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, relevant. Uh, iPhone 3G said, uh, don't forget that Hafs was also considered a big liar. That's true. So, so, so <laughs> and Abu Huraira as well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Muslims, if you don't, if you don't realize how how hilarious this is, uh, basically what you have throughout your history is there are always Muslims who are calling some other Muslims uh, liars, right? So they're all. It, yeah. it doesn't matter who you go to. Every, there are other Muslims who call him liar. And so, whenever we quote anything that's embarrassing. Whenever we quote something that's embarrassing, Muslims find some Muslim who called him a liar and say, you see, you have to reject everything he says, right? Well, yeah. uh, what, what iPhone 3G just pointed out was Hafs, Hafs was called a liar. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he was treated as if he was an un, he, as if he was untrustworthy. And just it, uh, right. Rashid, why, why should that be a problem for Muslims? Because Hafs is the one is one of the the guys who got we got the Quran through them, and uh, we read the Quran actually today with the Ruwayat Hafs, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the 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 transmission through Hafs. Mm -hmm. That's how we read it. So how can we trust a liar? And I heard the fu the funniest thing I read 
He's not trusted in the hadith, and he's trusted in the Quran. <laughs> yeah, that's what they say, right? So he's a liar. He's a liar when it comes to hadith, but not with this transmission of the Quran. <laughs> it's like somebody you say, he's not trusted with money, but he's trusted with gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> funny 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 stuff all right well uh tons yeah. tons of people said uh tons of people said uh thank you and uh thank you david and rashid uh Murban said does rashid have youtube yes i do unfortunately it's uh, most of it in arabic so i'm going to start doing some stuff in english like with david and and others so uh uh, just pray for me so I can be more present in English as well. Yeah, and uh, actually, uh, uh, Rashid, uh, as we're as we're closing out, I'll say anytime you want to come on, uh, especially especially during the coronavirus time when I'm I'm not traveling, um, I'm 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 around. So anytime you have a topic you want to cover, no problem. We'll 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 go live. Thank you so much for this open invitation. Thank you. God bless you. All right. Thanks. And uh, talk to everyone, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow. Uh, we were going to talk about some other stuff, but as usual, a, a Muslim in the chat brought up an issue, started challenging people, claimed that the Quran only allows defensive fighting. And so I told him, look, if you want to make that claim here in the chat, then we'll go ahead and cover that tomorrow. So Lord willing, be here tomorrow with shameless Sam Shamoon, and we'll be showing that the Quran calls for offensive jihad, not simply defensive jihad. Catch you all then.